there's a bill in Springfield to force some big cities in Illinois to abolish single-family zoning. It's not just a simple zoning change. There's a lot of issues that go into that. You'll hear from normal city manager Pam Reese. That's coming up on WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. Good evening, I'm Lauren Warnicke. On today's show, I'll take you to a new art exhibit at Heartland Community College in Normal. It draws inspiration from the resilience of perennial plants, telling the stories of six women who faced life's challenges with unwavering determination. Things can look hopeless, things can even look dead, but with time and care and nurturing, human beings come back too. Plus, you'll hear from the two Bloomington Normal natives who are bringing an indoor pickleball complex to town. That's coming up after a Bloomington Normal news update. This is Sound Ideas on 89.1 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR network. Support for WGLT comes from Bloomington Normal Audiology. Hear My Story continues with local patient Paul Brandt. They're really, really good. I'm just accustomed to having them on. I can watch TV with my wife now and we can set the volume where it's okay for her and it's great for me. Paul's full story can be found at bnaudiology.com. From the campus of Illinois State University in Normal, this is WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. I'm Lauren Warnicke in for John Norton. A new bill before the state legislature would effectively ban single-family zoning in Illinois municipalities with populations over 100,000 people. That wouldn't apply to Bloomington or Normal. But in this interview with WGLT's Charlie Schlenker, Normal City Manager Pam Reese says the issues the bill tries to address are important ones for the Twin Cities as well. The topic of providing diverse types of housing styles in communities has been a subject of discussion, frankly, for decades on how best to do it. Most recently, though, it's been a a nationwide issue, and part of it is because of just housing constraints, housing availability, housing affordability, different um, housing types and styles that people are now looking for. This particular legislation, although it doesn't apply to normal, I think that the purpose of addressing missing mental housing needs um, is of interest, and it has been on our radar. We actually have, as part of our strategic plan, a complete, not redo necessarily, but re- reviewing and amending our zoning code and our housing strategies. There are a lot of communities that have addressed this successfully, from what I understand. Some um, communities that we often use as references, Houston, Minneapolis, South Bend, Columbus, Ohio has been um, discussed recently. And what are they doing? They're working on increasing density in areas that have been single family zoned and allowing higher density units such as uh, duplexes, townhomes, maybe um, triplexes, and maybe perhaps even quadplexes. It's not just a simple zoning change. That comes at a cost to property owners and developers. There's also neighborhood impact what are the current residents' opinions on this sort of thing. So making zoning changes requires a lot of uh, community uh, participation. The nation, and speaking very broadly, has embraced single-family housing in a suburban style since just after World War II. Is there really a sustained push to reconsider what our municipalities look like nationwide, or is this just a point source response to a particular housing shortage? Well, certainly I would say that um, housing needs probably have ebbs and flows and modify over decades of time, for sure. And even to make changes like addressing missing middle, where you're trying to get developers to build something more than detached single-family homes, that doesn't happen overnight either. So what we're looking at is is hopefully you can start now and do longer-term solutions. But I'd have to believe that the interest in the type of residential style is going to constantly evolve. And so this is an evolution. In our community, we have a growing population of people age 65 and older that are renters. I would suspect that that will continue for a while. Empty nesters might be looking for a different type of housing style and getting out of detached single-family homes. So is it a quick fix or a 
Is it a solution looking for a problem that won't exist down the road? I don't know. I don't have a, the crystal ball for that. But I do know that over time, municipalities um, have to be nimble and adapt to needs and work with developers to address that. This is Sound Ideas. I'm Charlie Schlenker. We're talking with Normal City Manager Pam Reese. Is this also an opportunity? One of the knocks on the suburban style is that it can encourage uh, the ghettoization of certain lower income segments of the populace um, and that it has been used in some pl- places to do just that. Is this a chance to look at zoning and equity in the same frame? It certainly is a chance to do that, of course. For years, we were told that plunking high density apartment units, high rise buildings, all together in one particular neighborhood could raise concerns, raise environmental and and justice concerns, lots of pavement, things like that. Access to transportation is an issue. So I think now when we look at density and residential, we're looking at it from a much better scope. We're looking at it in terms of a walkable community, you know, access to services, access to health care, access to transit. I think what you're seeing nationally and and I believe locally is a reaction to what the community needs in terms of not just the type of housing unit, but kind of their lifestyle. The Regional Planning Commission is uh, preparing a report or actually a housing recovery plan. How do you plan to roll that into your zoning reconsideration? That's a good question. I want to certainly find out what the plan recommends in terms of community need, and then we will incorporate that as much as possible to the, you know, on how it fits in with our comprehensive plan and our zoning review. So there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle that have to fit together. I know that some of McLean County Regional Planning's housing um, evaluation has pertained to homelessness and maybe housing insecurities in our community. That is something of concern that has been of concern to council and to staff and to the community. So we want to make sure we can do what we can to address that. In addition, then we have the, the workforce housing need. So it's not an easy solution. McLean County just became a part of the Tri-County River Valley Development Authority, which enables local projects to access lower cost financing for for certain kinds of development, including industrial and business and multifamily housing. How fast will that be embraced by local project developers, do you think? I think it will be embraced uh, rather quickly if they have projects that are eligible for assistance through um, the Development Authority. Uh, Bloomington Normal Economic Development Council uh, is represented and and partners with uh, the River Valley Development Authority as well. So I think they're doing a great job of marketing the, the development opportunities or the tools in that toolbox. And if, if a project could be eligible for assistance, I think developers will jump on that. I'm aware of situations where uh, local developers have already been in contact with them. That's Normal City Manager Pam Reese. She spoke with WGLT's Charlie Schlenker. This is Sound Ideas on WGLT. I'm Lauren Warnicke. One of the nation's fastest growing sports will soon have its own dedicated playing facility in Bloomington Normal. 40 million Americans now play pickleball. That's a cross between tennis and ping pong. Bloomington natives Adam Bell and Alex Burge are heading up an investment group that plans to bring indoor pickleball courts to Bloomington Normal through a company called Pickler. The nine-court, 30,000-square-foot location will be inside the College Hills Plaza. That's near Tawanda and College Avenues. Adam Bell tells WGLT student reporter Eric Dito pickleball has been a family affair for him. My parents moved up to Wisconsin several years ago, and um, during the winters, there's not a whole lot to do, but there is kind of some tennis courts that they rehabbed into pickleball courts. So, you know, during Thanksgiving or Christmas or really whenever I'm up there visiting, it's something that, you know, I get to do 
with my family, with my sisters, my dad, my mom. We all get to get together, and it's kind of a bonding experience. It's competitive. It's fun. We have a lot of laughs. We have a great time. So, um, you know, we've just we've seen how huge the pickleball community has gotten, and we've heard that there's been a lot of demand in the Bloomington Normal area. So it's something that we wanted to uh, bring back to the community. Similarly to Adam, um, you know, I grew up playing any and every sport there was and I, I think the last few years it's been neat to see just the growth of pickleball and it, it's a sport that you can play with anybody and you know going out with friends and family and, and whoever it may be it's it's a fun way to compete a little bit and, and share some camaraderie and just have some fun so it's it's been exciting to play it and the growth of the sport generally has been wild so um, to see it continuing on the the trajectory that it is has been it's been cool. Alex, what would you say draws people to pickleball? What makes them want to play a sport? Maybe if they've played other sports or they're getting older, what what brings them into pickleball? Yeah, I mean, I would say a lot of different things. It's it's an easy sport to pick up and and be able to play. Um, you can play it with anybody. There's, you know, older folks play it. The average age now is 35 years old. Um, and last year there were almost 40 million people that played pickleball. So it's it's a big number, um, and anybody can do it. I was out a few days ago with my three-year-old nephew that's trying to learn how to play, and um, it's it's a very approachable sport um, to to do. There's a it, it's easy to to get people out there. Yeah, but the great thing is it can also be as competitive as you want it to be. So I mean, you can you really play with all different types of skill level. I mean, there can be people that are incredibly athletic and play extremely hard and you know turn it into a really competitive game while there's others that could approach it more as a social aspect in a way to kind of bond with friends or you know make friends even you know you go to a club like ours and you meet a bunch of people and you know you have a little bit of light competition and you kind of make new friends and meet new people so there's a lot of different ways to approach it and that's kind of the beauty of the game what drew you guys to pickler as opposed to any other brand adam yeah, great question. So the Pickler is probably the preeminent brand in pickleball. You know, there's a lot of different concepts out there that are looking at doing these hybrid restaurant with a couple pickleball courts. You know, we aren't really taking that approach. We're approaching it from, a, you know, delivering the best in class um, pickleball facility. And the Pickler provides that. They've signed, I think, around 300 franchise locations at this point with people such as Drew Brees and, you know, people that have been, you know, some of the largest Planet Fitness franchisees in the country. They have an amazing vendor relationship program where, you know, they deliver excellent, excellent materials in terms of the courts, the netting, the fencing, you know, every, the lighting especially. Like, everything is done at a first-class high level. So we think that, you know, partnering with them and kind of utilizing their expertise in the industry is something that that's going to be extremely beneficial to uh, our location and the community in general. Alex, what kind of amenities are we going to see inside of the facility? Yeah, we'll, we'll have nine indoor pickleball f- specific courts. Um, and then along with that, we'll have, you know, a warm up area with some, some stretching area, equip- weight equipment, um, just to get your body ready. And then a, a community room, which, you know, we certainly, I think, holistically view this as it's a community place right and and we want the community to really love it and have a place to call home for all their pickleball needs and the community room will be kind of that space within the facility for people to hang out before or after they play and meet new people and and just hang you know and and have fun and i I think it's it's going to be a one of the reasons pickler was attractive to us as well is it it's a pretty simple facility really it's pickleball it's camaraderie it's it's community and all that stuff so we um you know are are very excited about it yep and and, you know it'll also offer kind of some of your other general you know fitness location type amenities such as you know we'll have showers lockers um you know we'll have you know gatorades and protein bars that you can shop for Um, but additionally one of the great things about pickler to kind of expand on that relationship is their partnership with pickleball inc which is the preeminent you know national pickleball group um so you know what we'll be able to provide is top of the line paddles balls clothing options so we'll have a pro shop for people to kind of, you know, shop for all of their pickleball needs as well. That was Adam Bell and Alex Burge with the new pickleball franchise that's coming to normal this fall. They say Pickler is also working on setting up locations in Peoria, Champaign-Urbana, and the Quad Cities. Bell and Burge spoke with WGLT student reporter Eric Dito. 
Finally today on Sound Ideas, our weekly Datebook features a new exhibition at Joe McCauley Gallery. Now, typically Datebook is all about things you can do on the weekend, and that's not exactly the case here. McCauley Gallery is located on Heartland Community College's normal campus, and it's only open during the week. And it's also a bit of work to find this white-walled little gem in the Instructional Commons building. But trust me, it's worth it, particularly now as we approach Women's History Month. The exhibit features and centers the voices of six women. I can remember being 12 years old, thinking this will never happen to me again. I can remember saying no one is going to protect me but me, and that's how I live my life. I never let my past dictate my future. I've always been very spiritual. I chase what's in the Bible. I chase what my grandmother taught me. I chase trying to do the right thing so bad things would stop happening to me. I can remember running away. This is Anne. And being taken Artist David me. Dow created sculptures inspired by her and five other women for a solo show at Joe McCauley Gallery at Heartland Community College. Actually, it's not a solo show, sure. Dow made the sculptures, larger-than-life amalgams of reclaimed materials, modeling clay, paper mache, and what has to be thousands, if not tens of thousands, of handcrafted and strung glass beads. Next to each piece, there is a QR code where you can listen to each woman's story. The exhibition is about second chances. It's about resilience and rebirth. The title is Perennial Optimism 2.0. The overarching story is the lesson we can learn from nature. During the winter, we look outside, everything looks dead, dormant, dark. But with time and with care and nurturing, blooms start to occur. You see green, you see shoots, you see life coming back. And really, the the lesson is for us as human beings, it's the same with people. Things can look dark, things can look bleak. Things can look hopeless, things can even look dead, but with time and care and nurturing, human beings come back too. I am still a work in progress, and I feel like I will be forever, and that's okay. All but one of the six women featured in the show experienced incarceration. All but one received services from the YWCA of McLean County's Labyrinth Outreach Program and Labyrinth Made Goods. That's a program that Dow helped start. The outlier is Macaulay Gallery coordinator, Sharbanu Hamza. She and her sister had to flee the theocracy in Iran just to be women with a voice and to be artists without the fear of being picked up, arrested, tortured, disappeared, even murdered for not having their hijab on or for having a voice or for being a woman. Charbonneau's story is really interesting because she left her mother, her father, her family, the country she loved, and she came here to not such open arms necessarily. You know, when she and her sister first came here, people would say, aren't you grateful to be out of that country? And They would say, in the sense, we're grateful not to be fearful for our lives every day. Yes, but it's a country we love. Charbonneau's sculpture sits at the gallery's entrance, presiding over it, in a sense, acting as curator and providing a counter narrative to a different kind of incarceration. The physical distance from my roots did not sever the emotional ties that bound me to Iran. My heart, like a compass, continues to point back to the place I will call home forever. In every step, in every breath, I carry the echoes of the voices left behind. We imprison people. We take away their license, driver's license. Their license is for work. We take away their housing. Their ability to vote. Their ability to vote and their dignity. And then they get out and we expect them to be fully engaged in their community and contributing and all of that. It's, it's impossible. Oftentimes, particularly the, for the women that are incarcerated, but also the women of Iran, their stories are being told in the press. By proxy. By, proxy, by an attorney, by a man, in the case of women in Iran. Um, here, each of the women, even if they're not present during the exhibit every day, you can scan on the QR code and hear a three-minute message of hope about their lives, 
and then there's a 20 to sometimes 30 minute conversation um, with them about their journey. My neighbor overwintered her yard by just mowing the whole thing down. Hostas, crocuses, tulip, everything just mowed with her mower. You know, just chaos and, and hostility onto these plants, right? And you know what? They're going to make it. Like, they're going to come back. And I think it's such a beautiful metaphor that people can take a huge beating and still, like, be not just come back, but be kind of this symbol every spring of rebirth and optimism. I don't have any regrets because everything that I experienced created the person that I am, the, the person that I'm going to become. I'm not finished. I still have so much more to, to do. That's the power of the show and of nature. If you look into your garden, you think everything is dead and you're going to go out with a shovel and tear it all out, you're missing the opportunity for these beautiful flowers and plants to come back year after year, but with care and time and nurturing and attention, they'll thrive. So that, that's what we need to see in each other. David, there is a lot of feelings of despair and hopelessness about the state of our country and the, the volatility of our politics. And sometimes it is the most privileged of people who are complaining the most about that. So I wonder uh, where these women find the resilience to feel hopeful. I'm so sweet. I'm so gentle. I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. I don't give up. Regardless of what is put before me, I step on it. I walk over. It hurts. But it's not done. I have so much more to offer. Every one of these women, the entire show, has an affiliation with Heartland. Heartland is an amazing institution that is serving um, first-generation students, black and brown students, abled and disabled students, and creating, again, meaningful chances to lift themselves and their families up and to have bright futures. So. To be able to do this show here on the campus and in collaboration with Heartland is, is really meaningful. Perennial Optimism 2.0 has work by David Dow and features the voices of Anne, Shay, Hannah, Candace, Nita, and Charbonneau. The show is on now at Joe McCauley Gallery and runs through March 29th. Two panel discussions and a reception will take place on March 28th. Also that day, Labyrinth Made Goods will host a pop-up shop on Heartland's campus. That shop will remain open until April 11th. Support for arts and culture coverage on WGLT comes from PNC Financial Services. PNC is committed to supporting local arts and culture events in the communities they serve. Thanks for choosing WGLT's sound ideas made possible in part by Blooming to Normal Audiology. I'm Lauren Warnicke. We also had story help today from WGLT's Charlie Schlinker and student reporter Eric Dito. On this Birds Give Back Day, a big shout out to our student audio producer and editor, Ryan Tui. He edited today's show as he does every weekday. This is 89.1 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR Network.